All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here at 9. I realize for some of you it's probably early, so thank you for that. Um, so my name is Chris Peterson. I'm from Facebook. Uh, today I'm going to be co-presenting with Wesley Young from MicroSemi and Bob Pebley from Intel. We're going to talk a little bit about Lightning, which is Facebook's PCIe JBOF, or just a bunch of flash. We, we announced it at last year's OCP Summit, so this time we're going to come back, give you guys an update on it as well as talk through some of the challenges and solutions uh, that we've had to work through over the past year. So let's start with a quick update. So I'm happy to say today that we are in the final stages of the validation process. We've gone through all of our electrical, signal, signal integrity, thermal, mechanical, and functional testing, and everything is looking 100% solid. We've done a ton of uh, hot plug testing at this point with a number of different SSD suppliers, and we have a lot more planned. Um, again, things are looking very good, um, so I'm, I'm very pleased with the overall progress. On the OCP contribution side of things, our friends over at WeWin are in the process of putting together the contribution package, which will be a full design package. That will get released in the coming months, uh, and will include everything, including the schematics, the layout, the bomb, all of the, the pieces required for the design itself. Also, on the software side of things, uh, we have the Lightning Open BMC. So that is the uh, BMC code that runs within the Lightning chassis, and that is already posted on, on GitHub at this point. So we fully expect that we'll continue to push bug fixes and additional features upstream as we have them, uh, and you can check it out on GitHub right now. Uh, the other interesting piece on the software side, which is a little bit different from some of the things we've done in the past, is that we also have some open source switch management as well as some driver work that has been going on, and Wes will touch on that in just a minute. So we knew that going into this project, we were going to have a number of very large challenges. We're kind of on the bleeding edge of some of the, these technologies, and so we knew going into it, things were going to get interesting. So today we're going to talk about three of those, the big challenges that we had to work on. The first one was M.2 support. So as one of our design objectives, we, the intent was to be able to support multiple form factors. So we want to be able to support three and a half inch drives, two and a half inch drives, and M.2 SSDs. So M.2 in particular was a, a special challenge due to the thermal and hot plug concerns, and I'll get to that in just a moment. The other challenge that we had was enclosure management. There's not yet a standardized method to do enclosure management over PCIe. There's stuff in flight, but it's not done yet. And we were a year before we, you know, we were working on this last year, so it was even before any work that's going on now. So we also needed a solution for that. And then finally, everyone's favorite topic, PCIe hot plug. So this has always been a challenge, and uh, one of our design principles was also to make SSD replacement as seamless as it is today when you go in and replace hard drives. That is not something that was working very effectively or reliably uh, with existing PCIe SSDs, so we spent a, an enormous amount of time on that, and we'll have a bunch of slides to talk about that later. So let's get into some of these. So let's start with the M.2 support. So as most of you probably know, M.2s have two particular challenges, at least in this environment. The first one is from a power and thermal perspective. So an, an M.2 is an eight and quarter watt device, and you're packing that into the volume of about one quarter of the volume of a U.2 or a two and a half inch drive. So the power density is extremely high. On top of that, the M.2 form factor itself does not provision uh, does not provide any provisions for a heat sink or even a mounting location for a heat sink, so we had to work around that in some fashion. The second problem with M.2s is basically that they were never designed for a hot plug environment to begin with, right? They were intended to go into your laptop or something like that where you're never going to pull the drive in and out. So, of course, there are electrical and mechanical challenges there because the interface wasn't designed for that. So we had to solve this problem as well. So I'm pleased to share with you guys today that this is our solution to that problem. This is an M.2 carrier that we've created that solves both problems for us. So inside of this, and you guys can see this a bit later, it's also uh, in the Facebook booth if you want to look at it more closely, there's a PCB inside of here that acts as an interposer. That PCB provides two pieces of functionality. One, it fans out the PCIe lanes from the four lanes coming in to the two lanes going to each of the M.2s. The second equally important function is the fact that it provides us with a hot pluggable interface. So the connector that is on here is the standard U.2 SFF 8639 connector, which we all know and love and is very reliable and capable of doing hot plug. It has millions of cycles on it, and we know it's going to work. 
The other convenience in this is that we also get the benefit of it being backwards compatible to U.2 SSDs at the same time. So we, we, we have solved the, the problem in a backwards compatible fashion. Secondly, thermals. As I mentioned, the power density of M.2s is very high. It's important that we come up with a thermal solution that solves both the cooling on top of the M.2s as well as on the bottom. So the carrier itself it acts as the heat sink for the M.2s in, uh, on there. The other aspect of cooling that is important is we don't just want to cool these things. We want to cool them efficiently. It's very important for both from an operating perspective that we come up with something that is efficient over the long term so that we don't spend money cooling these things over the long haul, right? So um, I'm pleased to share with you guys today that this design at a 30 degree C ambient temperature allows us to run the fans at only a 20% PWM. That gives us an extremely efficient C CFM per watt and gives us plenty of headroom for higher ambient temperatures or potentially even higher power M.2s should we want to go there at some point. So we've talked a little bit about some of the M.2 challenges. So next, uh, we need to tackle the enclosure uh, challenges. So to do that, Wes is going to walk, uh, walk us through that. Sure. Thanks, Chris. So when we approached the Lightning project, we wanted to look at um, kind of how are we going to build a, a JBOF. Uh, and it really kind of breaks down into these two pieces. Uh, so the initial thought was, well, it's easy. You just search replace SAS with PCIe, and you replace the D and JBOD with JBOF, and you're done. But it's a little more complicated than that. And so with our experience in SAS, we looked at what we really had. You've got your host or your management host. Uh, you've got a you know, HBA, IOC. Uh, you've got a SAS expander, and you've got a bunch of SAS disks. And that, in the hardware, is really all you need. So we made a mirror of that. We've got your host or management host. You've got a PCIe switch. You've got a bunch of NVM SSDs. So we thought we were done. But really, the big difference is that just solves the hardware problem. The bigger issue is really, how do you manage the thing? You've, you've got this JBOF, you've got a rack of them. How are you going to manage to actually get around and you know, query it, figure out how to upgrade it, uh, things like that? So we looked again on the SAS side. And on the SAS side, you've got the SES target. You've got SCSI enclosure services. It's well-defined. It's in the spec. Uh, Chris had mentioned you know, there, there was no activity at the time that we were planning this in terms of the NVM space. So we charted out uh, a new solution for, for the Lightning. So on the SAS side, you've got ports that support uh, in-band, out-of-band management. The expander can respond. You can query it. You can figure out enclosure services. Sounds great. So really what we're missing on the PCIe side is uh, this concept of, of a management endpoint, something in the PCIe switch uh, that you can target instructions, queries, questions, um, data. You want to pull data about the switch and everything it's plugged into, you know, what temperature is the thing running at. So MicroSemi uh, introduced uh, this concept of a management endpoint uh, which really just shows up on your, your PCI bus, and you can target uh, in-band traffic to it. Uh, it, is, it also responds to out-of-band traffic, so if you've got I squared C or TWI, uh, it'll talk that. Uh, we also introduced a new concept called the memory mapped remote procedure call. We've got a bunch of interesting features that are in the switch, um, and they're all you know, command-based. But of course, you don't want to be interactively sending commands uh, you know, through a UART or something to this, uh, to this JBOF. Uh, so we provide an in-band mechanism where you essentially mem memory map uh, commands into the switch uh, through the endpoint. And then the switch goes and does what you ask it to do. So that's especially useful for things like uh, dynamic resource assignment. If you want to move drives from one domain to another, uh, that can be done entirely in-band. So moving to the next slide, how did we really solve this? Well, we had kind of two pieces that we wanted to build out. Uh, because we wanted to be really uh, active in, in the open uh, compute uh, ecosystem, we wanted all of this to be open. So when we built up a kernel driver, uh, we built it to be extremely lightweight uh, and simple and really just provide a pipe into the switch. And then we went and we had it upstreamed. So it's actually targeting kernel 4.11, and there's a bunch of details um, that are linked here. 
Uh, this driver is entirely accessible to anybody. You can download it, you can read up on it, you can compile it if you don't have, uh, clearly we don't have kernel 4.11 yet, uh, and allow you to actually take a look at it. The idea is that in, in these sort of kernels that support this, or kernels that where this uh, driver has been backported, uh, you'll be able to plug a switch text switch into your, your host. And if the switch text switch has the management endpoint exposed, it'll just show up. It'll show up as dev slash switch tech number. And the number indicates that it's just like NVM. Uh, you can have as many switches as you want plugged into your host. As an added piece, what we also wanted to do was really take a look at how uh, NVM drives were being managed. And there was a big push to, to this utility called NVM CLI. And NVM CLI was, was a great way for the open source community to have access to be able to query, manage, upgrade, uh, check on the NVM devices. So that kind of solves the drive side. So on the switch side, we wanted to have something really similar. And so on the switch, we introduced a user space utility uh, called Switch Tech, which lets you do exactly the same kind of things you can do with NVM CLI. It has a command set that looks very similar to NVM CLI and uh, allows you to do firmware uploads, downloads, error performance monitoring, uh, look at the temperature of the device, as you can see in the example here. Uh, look at all your ports, see what the statuses are, you know, what link state are they in, how are they looking. So how does this whole thing look kind of in the, in the bigger architecture? Really, Lightning sits kind of in that blue box at the bottom, and it um, represents your hardware and firmware layer. Uh, the switch firmware also sits kind of in this, in this blue bubble at the bottom. And we wanted to layer uh, really a kernel driver that allowed for the switch to then be exposed to uh, the driver side and user mode side of the, of the Linux kernel. And by doing that, we end up pushing all of the switch functionality upwards, allowing for uh, not only the NVM CLI-like functionality of, um, of the switch tech user space tool, but also some libraries, which can then be integrated with partner uh, devices, which have drivers of their own. And then that gets wrapped up and pushed up for a higher level orchestration. So this kind of helps solve that issue by allowing for um, the ability to kind of build up on this, on this uh, kernel driver ecosystem and then push it upwards. So the higher level software now has something it kind of understands how to manage, a lot like SAS did. So that really covers the, the management piece. Um, the much bigger topic is uh, really uh, the, the hot plug piece. And, and as Chris mentioned, the, the idea here is that we wanted to really uh, work on figuring out how you could user replace uh, NVM drives like you could, you know, standard SAS drives. So Bob's going to talk about that. All right. So when we started this project, we had a pretty simple high-level goal, which was be able to walk up to a system, yank a drive, add a drive, and not end up with this. So we didn't want blue screens. We wanted a stable system. Didn't want to see machine checks. And believe me, when we started, this was the situation we were in with the software <coughs> stack on top of it. So. A lot of you might be thinking, hot plug, it's been around for a while. Uh, what's the big deal? We've been doing that for years. Well, we want to distinguish something here. What you're probably used to is what we call managed hot plug. And that's where you actually have a handshake and interaction that says, I'm about to remove this drive. You walk up, you push a button, some lights flash, there's a handshake, software goes, quiesces the drive, stops issuing the uh, application, it's closes down the application so it's no longer issuing I.O. to the drive. And it actually quiesces the drive, stops all I.O., and even powers it down so that when you remove the drive, there's nothing going on. It's basically off. That's not the case we were looking for here. As Chris stated earlier, we were looking for the case to make this just like standard spinning drives where you can walk up and pull it. And the other catch with managed hot, uh, add and remove is there's that big software dependency there, too, that it can actually is in a state where it can quiesce things and isn't hung up. So the, when it does hang up, you're back into the surprise case anyway, so we figured we got to support surprise hot plug from, from the get-go. And the other aspect is operator error. A lot of times somebody walks up, you got a big bank of drives, all these LEDs flashing, I'm going to pull a drive, and pulls the wrong drive. So you might have quiesced the drive for a managed hot plug, and your operator walks up and pulls the wrong drive, and now you've got surprise hot plug 
on another drive. So the big distinguishing factor about Surprise Hot Plug is there is no button. You just walk up, remove the drive. So you're entirely dependent on things like presence detect and your data link layer state changes to detect the presence and absence of a device. So there were a number of challenges involved in this. The first was completion timeouts. So this is a mechanism in PCIe. Uh, if you're familiar with the PCIe protocol, it's a request and response protocol. So your memory reads, writes, back in the PCIe, PCI days, we're out in a parallel bus. In PCIe, it's all message-based. So a transaction is actually a request that goes out. The endpoint processes it and responds with a completion. And there's two types of transactions, posted and non-posted. Uh, posted transactions are ones that only have the request part and there is no completion. So these are things like memory writes. It's just the memory write is sent out and it's assumed that the endpoint's going to process it. There's no completion that comes back. Those are posted. They're not the problem. Non or the non-posted transactions are what the issue is in Surprise Hot Plug. A non-posted transaction is where it's the traditional split transaction model. The request goes out, the device processes it, and sends back a response. And it's either with or without data, depending on the type of transaction. So these are things like memory reads, configuration reads and writes, and your traditional I.O. cycles. And the problem with Surprise Hot Plug is I walk up, yank the drive. The application may have lots of I.O. outstanding. And I've got these requests that are in flight. So the PCI spec defines the completion timeout mechanism as something that uh, all init device, initiator devices optionally support, can be disabled, it's usually enabled on all devices, and it's the mechanism to protect when that completion never comes back, whether it's because of a defective device, the device is gone, or just other problems in the system. And the issue with the completion timeout is that the PCI uh, SIG defines it with a very broad range. Uh, the range of the timeout is anywhere from 50 microseconds to 50 milliseconds, which in I.O. time is a huge amount of time. And what happens is when you pu pull that drive, I.O. is keeping, many think of a today's sing or dual socket system with upwards of 100 potential hyper threads all issuing I.O. There could be tons, not can, there will be tons of I.O. pending to these devices when you pull it. And the completion timeout is the mechanism to, uh, to terminate that with a correctable AER error. Uh, that handles the reporting of the error, but you still have another aspect to it, which is the read itself and what's going to happen with that. And we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide. The other point I'll make is that there's that broad range of timeouts uh, from 50 microseconds to 50 milliseconds. The typical timeout on an Intel processor, for example, is roughly 17 to 18 milliseconds, which is still a lot of time. Uh, the PCI spec does define the ability, if you look at the spec, it has A, B, C, D. You can define a much more granular range. But in a typical general purpose system, it's not very useful because you don't know what your endpoint is. You don't know what its characteristics are. You don't know how many switches are in the hierarchy that could cause additional time and delays. Uh, so it's very difficult in an open general purpose system to dial that into a more granular, finely controlled timeout. So it might be useful on an embedded system where it's a controlled configuration. You know every device you could dial it in. But in my experience, every BIOS I've seen just leaves a default to the standard default timeout. So if you want to advance. Uh, so what happens when you get that? You get the, the, the AER error. The, uh, you still have all these threads with I.O. pending. What happens to them? Because that AER error is asynchronous. The PCI spec also defines what's known as the all ones completion. So for when that completion timeout occurs, it will return, it will synthesize a all ones completion for that transaction. So you have a memory read in flight. It gets all ones back. And there's no other indication to that thread that had that request that there was an error. It's just you got all ones, and asynchronously some error interrupt happened over here. So this was the big problem that we had with Lightning, was the entire software stack had no clue what an all ones transaction. The NVMe driver didn't know what it was. The PCIe drivers and the AER drivers, all the drivers in this stack had no support for all ones completions. Now, in the case of NVMe, we got semi-lucky in that the NVMe interface is a very modern interface. It's all designed around DMA push-pull. There's very few non-posted transactions. The one exception is a once per second pull from a kernel thread that's checking the controller status, saying, are you still there? Are you healthy? 
And so it does that one read once per second, and it just so happened that the one bit that says controller failure was defined that one was a failure. So when you yanked the drive, you got an all once completion, uh, the NVMe driver said, oh, my driver failed. Sounds great, we're all good, right? No. What the NVMe driver then proceeded to do, it, it detected that as controller failure, not controller gone. So it said, oh, I've got to go reset this controller, see if I can recover it. And so it went through a much longer sequence trying to reset, recover, abandon the I.O. And then when that failed, because the device wasn't there, and oh, by the way, a lot more I.O., all those 17 and a half milliseconds completion time out, time is stacking, 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 only to come to the conclusion, wow, it's really dead, I can't fix it. So then the NVMe driver says, okay, I will unload myself from this device. So what does it do? It goes out, a lot more I.O., let's go through the whole MSI vector table for every queue in this device, disable the interrupt vector, and because I want to make sure that my writes to disable it have taken effect, I'll do a read back then, too. So all these things are timeout, 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 timeout. You can just see the problem, all this I.O. stacking up. So the big thing here was adding all one support. So to that end, what we did is a number of driver enhancements in the Linux stack. Uh, with downstream port containment driver, something new, I'm going to let Wes talk about that in a second. That was kind of an addition to make it even better, in addition to all the fixes we did here. But it was enhancements to the PCI driver, the AER driver, the NVMe driver, to basically recognize the all once completion and properly process it. So now the NVMe driver, when it does that health poll and gets all ones, it says, oh, my device is gone. I'm not going to go try to clean it up. I'm not going to go try to quiesce it gracefully. I'm just going to go abort all my user I.O. with errors and return that to the stack above and get out cleanly. So eliminate a lot of I.O. The AER driver had a similar thing. It would actually go out and try to walk through the device capabilities list to find its registers, get all ones completions, and follow a list link of a linked list of pointers where the pointer was FFFF, and it would just do that over and over. The only thing that saved it from itself was somebody did a calculation at one point and put a time to live on the loop that went through that chain and realized that the maximum number of uh, possible extended capabilities in PCI Express was 480, which was the maximum size of the configuration space divided by the minimum size of the control. So, once we did that and fixed up all the drivers and introduced the DPC driver, then we realized as we started integrating this throughout the ecosystem, the block level driver above us all of a sudden was exercising a lot of paths that it wasn't use, used to exercising. So we exposed some errors and conditions and paths that weren't quite as thoroughly tested because they just weren't experienced before because IO usually completed and it wasn't a case where IO errors were being returned. So, in summary, what you have on the left is a trace, PCI traces that we captured in the debug of this mess. And before you think, wow, that's a lot of I.O., that was on a single drive with, that was idle. There was no application I.O. That was just a drive sitting in Linux with a one read every second pulling it for health. And when you pulled the drive, thousands of I.O.s all hitting this 17 plus millisecond timeout which explained why this, the system would just go dead for 20 seconds and then eventually recover maybe if it didn't uh, machine check or panic in the kernel. Once all those uh, software additions were made, that pull of the drive is now down to about 20 IOs to go for the AER to go through process, realize, oh, the device isn't there, for the NVMe driver to process, and everybody aborts out cleanly. Uh, so it was quite an accomplishment and it made it very stable and very clean. And then. In addition to that, there's some new capability in the uh, PCI spec with downstream port containment that we also enabled and Wes is going to talk about. Great. Thanks, Bob. So I've been told uh, we're running really short on time. Uh, we knew this would happen. This is a big topic, and uh, we have half an hour, 25 minutes to talk about it. So just quickly point out, I know Chris is going to bring it up as well, we do have a Q&A session uh, in the Alameda conference room in the Hyatt. So if you guys do want to come, we have an extra hour there to, to cover any questions. So uh, we're low on time. I'm going to make this the lightning round, and that's totally pun intended. Uh, what is downstream port containment? Uh, it's really a new thing. It got put into the spec in 3.1. Uh, not a lot of people or, or um, uh, standards really kind of picked it up. So it exists, but uh, it hasn't really been implemented until now. Uh, so the switch fully supports this feature. It allows us to not only contain an error, but it allows us to send that error information through AER and let the host know. Legacy PCIe 
uh, you kind of had two choices. You could let the error go to the host, which will cause the blue screen, or you could mask the error. And if you mask it, uh, the error doesn't go to the host. It doesn't blue screen for that particular instance, if you do the pull. Uh, but it also doesn't know that an error occurred at all. So not really a great solution. And DPC was really there to solve that problem, get the two pieces in, uh, contain the error, let the host know that there was an error. What was added was a new DPC driver, which uh, now is, is part of Linux and in uh, kernel 4.7. And that driver enables the DPC feature as per the spec. Uh, the switch now has hardware to be able to use that feature. And when the switch puts a port into containment, the driver also has the responsibility to clear the port and say that the port is OK now. You're ready to add a drive back into it. And that's really a check to ensure that a badly behaving drive that's flipping up and down, you keep it down. You don't want to bring that port back right away. And so the driver is really there to make sure that you know, it knows the drive is gone, it's happy. It brings the port back online. You can now plug a new drive back in. So I'll let Chris uh, wrap this one up. All right, so in summary, we talked about M.2 support, we talked about enclosure management, and we talked about PCIe hot plug. On M.2s, we have both a thermal and a hot plug solution for those with the new carrier design. And in, on the enclosure management side, we have open source solutions to both the BMC portion of things as well as the switch management portion of things. And then on the PCIe hot plug side of things, we now have a clean, reliable, uh, method to be able to do surprise hot plug uh, in, in a way that is seamless and will work uh, in no matter the environment that we're working in. And on top of that, it's all in open source. So if you want to go implement it, go pull down the code from the Linux community and go do it. So uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure there's a number of questions from people. So please join us right after this in the Alameda conference room. We'd be happy to take those.